Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ontario Archaeology 101, the third in our OHS REACH project webinar series. My name is Sarah McCabe, and I'm the project manager and librarian at the Ontario Historical Society. A very quick word about the OHS. The Ontario Historical Society is a nonprofit corporation, publisher, and registered charity, a non-government group founded in 1888, bringing together people of all ages, all walks of life, and all cultural backgrounds interested in preserving some aspect of Ontario's history. Our webinar will start very shortly. I'll do a brief bit of technical support, introduce our speaker, and then we'll head right into the presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to very briefly go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. So you can see we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer's speaker system by default, but if you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter or OHS staff by typing your questions into the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and I'll be keeping an eye on these as we go along and jumping in as appropriate. We'll also address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If you're finding that the slides are moving very slowly or your audio keeps cutting out, try closing a few other programs. The more bandwidth you're using, the harder the webinar program has to work. If you lose your connection, try closing the webinar window and then re-entering the room using the link you received in the email. So closing and restarting will usually solve the problem. This webinar will be recorded and that recording will be made available to OHS members on our website after the series. And later the public will, will have access through our YouTube channel. We will also make today's slides available uh, this afternoon, so don't worry about writing everything down. So I'd like to introduce our speaker now, Paul Racher. Paul is a principal at ARA Limited, Ontario's oldest archaeological and heritage consulting firm. He began his career there in 1986, and over the three decades since, he's overseen the completion of several hundred archaeological and cultural heritage contracts. Currently, he's serving as president of the Ontario Archaeological Society. The Ontario Archaeological Society is a registered charitable organization that promotes the ethical practice of archaeology. The OES is also one of our fellow provincial heritage organizations. So Paul and I thought it would be a great thing to work together to share with the Ontario heritage community an introduction to the province's archaeological past, which is older than the pyramids. So a big thanks to Paul for his expertise and for making time for the sharing. So right now I'm going to switch control of the screen over to Paul, who is coming to us from Kitchener today, I'm pretty sure. So just a moment while we change the views. All right. Well, I hope they're up there. I can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Over to you. Wonderful. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, thank you for having me. This is my first webinar, so I, I hope it goes well. It's I'm, I'm not actually coming to you from Kitchener. I'm coming to you from my bedroom in Burlington where I've locked up all my dogs and, and I'm hoping that no children come bursting in during this. Um, yeah, so off we go. The, the title of the talk is Ontario Archaeology 101 or 12,000 years in 60 minutes. I'm hoping it'll be a little less than 60 minutes so we have lots of time for questions. So anyway, first off, I just wanted to say what a shame it is that you can't see me right now. I, I sat for this photograph just yesterday and Frankly, it doesn't begin to do me justice. It's just I'm a crazy, handsome devil. So just just imagine that uh, while you're sitting there. It's not true. That's actually uh, what I look like most of the time. Not Indiana Jones by any means, I'm afraid. Usually surrounded by children and with some goofy look on my face. But uh, 
That's not the case of the archaeology I'm here to talk about. That is much more photo worthy and wonderful, and that's what matters. You know, Ontario has a rich 12,000 year long archaeological record. It's a record that's represented by puzzling and fascinating and mysterious and beautiful artifacts. And, uh, well, it's been my vocation for 30 years and I never get tired of it. Broadly speaking, we divide the, archaeolog the archaeological history of the province into two categories, pre-contact and post-contact. Now, post-contact used to be called historic. Um, contact coincides with the arrival of Europeans around AD 1600 or so, our friend Samuel de Champlain, who you can see in this photo here. Uh, with all due apologies to you, hit to you history buffs, though, the term historic is a bit of a problem for many first peoples since they feel it suggests that there was no history before the arrival of Europeans. And I'm more than inclined to agree with them. You know, history, history goes all the way back, regardless of, you know, whether or not we have uh, the kind of documentary evidence that historians like to work with. The pre-contact history of the First Peoples of Ontario is further divided into three periods. First off, the Paleo-Indian period, which is roughly 11,500 to 9,500 years ago. Secondly, the Archaic period, 9,500 to about 3,000 years ago. And finally, the Woodland period, about 3,000 years ago to roughly A.D. 1650. Now, the Paleo-Indians, the First people. Of, uh, of Canada were incredibly mysterious. In fact, they're, they're kind of what drew me into archaeology to begin with. And that's because the story of these, these first first peoples, the so-called Paleo-Indians, and the I word is not a word we like to use often, but our terminology just hasn't caught up, I'm afraid, with, uh, uh, with, with the modern day yet. But uh, anyway, as far as the Paleo-Indians go, we just don't know how much we don't know much about how these early people lived. We don't know what language they spoke. We don't know what was important to them. Their sites are very rare. In fact, some archaeologists have suggested that when they made their appearance sometime around 12,000 years ago, there may have been less than 200 people living in the entire province. So all we really know about them is that, first off, they seem to have arrived in Ontario from the west. Secondly, they lived in a pretty rugged environment that started as uh, subarctic and later became boreal in nature. Third, they appeared to have relied on the hunting of big game animals, you know, mastodons and elk and reindeer and that sort of thing. And finally, they made big, beautiful spear points, actually so beautiful and so unique that there's really nothing else like them almost anywhere in the world. Now, our lack of understanding of this period means that when we talk about these first people, we have to fill in a lot of the gaps in our information with imagination. And if any of you have ever seen the pre-contact exhibits at most museums, it's clear that we're not very good at this. The displays are almost always terrible. And at this point, I think it's worth making a short tangential journey to examine why. The first problem is a fundamental problem in archaeology, and that's preservation. Simply put, organic materials such as wood, bone, cloth, antler, and leather just don't preserve well in the ground. And yet these materials were the most available, sustainable, and useful raw materials that people had at their, disposable for making, at their disposal for making the items they needed to survive. So take a look at this 1845-ish painting by Paul Kane. It's of an Ojibwe camp on the shores of Lake Huron. And try to imagine when you're looking at it, how much of what you see would be left if those people walked away from it and simply left it for, say, 100 years? How about 500 years? Or how about 11,500 years? Would any of the things that you see in this picture endure over that, that, that sort of time period? Would anything left be that important? You know, would it be something you could interpret? Would it have anything to say about what mattered to those people in the picture? It's pretty unlikely. You know, a joke that, uh, that, that my mentor used to tell me when I started in archaeology is that as we go back in time, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to build entire cultures from essentially the contents of their cutlery drawers, you know, their, their hard toolkits. 
The second problem is us. And that is to say, when we imagine the past, we're often hampered by traditional stereotypes of what the past ought to be like. These were most famously articulated by the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who suggested that the lives of people living in traditional societies, or living in a state of nature, as he put it, were solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And it really wasn't until anthropologists started studying hunter-gatherers in the mid-20th century that it was discovered that most of them lived quite comfortably while working fewer hours per day than ourselves. In fact, it's worse than that, because most of the hunting and gathering peoples that were still left by the mid-20th century were in the most ridiculously difficult environments. And I'm talking about like the Bushmen of the Kalahari, uh, Australian Aborigines, and so forth. So these people lived in, in, in incredibly harsh environments, and yet anthropologists find that they really only need to work two or three hours a day to survive, and that's in a harsh environment. So imagine how little work might be required in, say, a temperate environment like our own. The third problem, whenever we interpret the past, particularly the Aboriginal past, comes from who we are and where we stand in history. And it really tends to come into play in Canada when we're discussing the archaeology of First Peoples. Specifically, we Euro-Canadians are the settler society. We're the newcomers, the interlopers. And it's abundantly clear that as a society, we haven't exactly been kind in the way that we've, in, that we've dealt with Indigenous peoples uh, to date. Historically, that means we've tended to cling to stereotypes, to denigrate, mock, and downplay the cultures and lifestyles of those peoples. And it seems quite clear that if we accepted that these societies were and are wonderful, then we'd have to acknowledge the stain on ourselves for having treated them so poorly. And this is the essence of colonialism. And it's why it's been so hard to eradicate. Colonialism doesn't require old-style racism to work. It just needs us to make assumptions, often handed down to us as true, and then not challenge them. And I'm going to be coming back to this quite extensively later. What all of this means is that we have to be really careful in how we imagine the past. We have to proceed from the facts we have at hand, of course, but we also need to question our stereotypes and biases. What makes archaeology both beautiful and terrible is that the object of our study is hidden, incomplete, and mysterious. You know, it's an adventure to be able to explore the past, and it's extremely gratifying when we make a discovery, but those discoveries are difficult, our interpretations are often partial, and it's easy to be wrong and embarrass yourself. When I was a little boy, I loved reading Greek myths, and in Greek myths, if a, if a character exhibited hubris, they were always punished for it. You know, it's hubris, that, that, that excessive pride. Um, it's something that in archaeology is quickly and disproportionately punished. You know, it has no place in the heart of an archaeologist. When you do archaeology, you need to be comfortable with doubt, with unknowing. And a good archaeologist is one who understands this part of its nature and is humble before it. Now, if you, want to look, if you want to imagine what it looks like to question our stereotypes and biases while acknowledging some universalities in the human experience, I'd like to introduce you to the work of my friend Emily Damstra. She's an artist out of Kitchener and Guelph who, uh, who does quite a lot of work for the Canadian Mint. I believe she did the Lucky Looney that was used at the Winter Olympics uh, uh, a couple Olympic cycles ago. Now, if you, if you look at this picture here, every element that you see Every element that you see in all of her illustrations is rooted in careful, scientific, archaeological research, but is presented in the context of even more important things that we know to be true. For instance, that people lived in families, that life wasn't all about hard work, and that archaeological sites weren't just places where people worked and slept, but places where children played, parents loved them, and grandparents taught them. Consider this exhibit. It's from the American Museum of Natural History. This is actually one of the better ones I found. Most of them feature some beetle-browed people walking around with, you know, spears in their hand or, or bows and arrows or, you know, carrying some sort of tomahawk. But take a look at this. Now compare and contrast it with this illustration by Emily. You know, there's as much difference between them as you'd find between the words on the label, the label of a pill bottle and those from a poem by T.S. Eliot. Emily's work is evocative. It's alive and it's beautiful. And everything you see in that picture 
is indicated by the archaeological remains that we found on that site. Anyway, let's get back to the archaeology. We haven't discussed the Archaic period yet. I'm, I was chasing rabbits, but uh, anyway, beginning around 10,000 years ago, the climate warmed and the environment started to become more like what it is today. As the deciduous forest spread into Ontario, more plant and animal food sources became available. And it's at that time when the archaeological cultures that we call archaic emerged. It's probably safe to say that the most common types of sites we encounter during archaeological assessments anywhere in Ontario are, archaeologic, are archaic sites. There's so many different archaic artifact types that your eyes would glaze over if I tried to take you through them all. So really what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to hit the high points. Also, I don't want to make you actually fall asleep or conceivably die of boredom. I'm sitting here. I know you're listening to me, but I can't see your faces. So, you know, in dire moments, I'm imagining you rolling your eyes. In happy moments, I'm imagining you all nodding and smiling. I'm trying to keep it to the happy one. So the big picture of the archaic um, comes down to these items here. First off, there's every indication that archaic peoples had an encyclopedic knowledge of their environment and how to extract what they needed from it with minimal effort. That's extremely important. You know, we think of hunters and gatherers as sort of, you know, skinny, skinny people wandering around, clutching their bellies, you know, combing over the landscape for anything that they could eat or kill or whatever. And it just really wasn't that way. For hunting and gathering, you know, when, you, when, when you're raised in that environment and in that lifestyle, really hunting and gathering is more like a harvest than, than something that requires a lot of effort. They knew where the animals were going to be. They knew what plants were coming into season and when and where they would be. Like, they were environmental experts. Secondly, the Archaic Period is the first time we encounter structures like houses in the archaeological record. This is probably just thanks to better preservation than we see on earlier sites. On Paleo-Indian sites, we, there's just not a lot of stuff. Thirdly, the Archaic is the first time we see clear evidence of ceremonialism and ritual behavior in the archaeological record. Again, I think it's unlikely that that sort of thing didn't exist amongst the Paleo-Indians, but preservation being what it is, we just, we just don't find a lot of evidence for it. Fourth, there's plenty of evidence for huge trade networks that span the continent from the Gulf of Mexico to the far north. I've worked on archaic sites in Thunder Bay where we found marine shells that were from the Gulf of Mexico on those sites. And similarly, um, throughout North America, you can find native copper artifacts that are from the Thunder Bay area that, you know, that predate the use of copper by my ancestors in England. Finally, the lifestyles we see represented on archaic sites were so sustainable and so successful that many of the archaeological traditions we find lasted for hundreds or even thousands of years. Now, the Archaic Period was followed by what archaeologists call the Woodland Period around 2,800 years ago. And the Woodland Period starts with the appearance of, the appearance of pottery. And really, for, that first tw for the first 1,200 years of the Woodland Era, that pottery is almost the only thing that distinguishes it from the Archaic way of life. Hunting and gathering still appears to have remained the primary mode of subsistence really right through until around A.D. 400. Now, starting around AD 400, we find the first rudimentary evidence of maize, or what we call corn, horticulture on sites belonging to what archaeologists call the Princess Point culture. The Princess Point is a, it's a middle woodland culture. Now, many of these sites are located along the Grand River. And here's another one of my friend Emily's illustrations of what life might have looked like then. We know that most of the communities were usually on flood plains, and that people hunted, fished, and grew corn kind of maybe gardened corn might be a better way of looking at it, and that the rivers served as their highways for travel. By the way, if you look at these smiling children in the middle of the picture, the life model she used were, were my two youngest kids, Amelia and Sam. So good fun. She's, she's preserved them for posterity. <laughs> 
Now between around AD 1000 and AD 1650, during what we call the Late Woodland Period, maize horticulture allowed for population increases, which in turn led to larger settlement sizes, higher population density, and increased social complexity amongst the peoples involved. It's during this time that we encountered the Longhouse peoples, who were the ancestors of the Wendat, or Huron, Huron, the Neutral, and the Petun nations that the French met when they arrived here in the, the early 1600s. Now, during this period, villages covered as much as five hectares, with longhouses sometimes reaching over 100 meters in length. I believe the record, um, and again, this is from the 70s, so I can't convert it back. And I'm kind of old, and I'm not great at metric, but the record is around 400 feet for a single longhouse. And it's believed some of these settlements may have held as many as 2,500 or more inhabitants. You almost, you almost need to think of them as being uh, comparable, really, to, to medieval towns rather than, you know, than, than poor tiny villages. Now, late woodland sites are wonderful for several reasons. First off is that the preservation from them, particularly the later ones, is excellent. We don't just get durable items like stone tools and pottery, but bone, shell, wood, botanicals, you know, such as seeds and wood, and we even get the outlines of their houses. If you look on the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see essentially an aerial view of a longhouse we excavated in 2001. And in, in, in the bottom right, you can see the, the original location of the longhouse. Those large gray features in it are sweat lodges which is pretty fabulous. And at some point in the top left part of that image, you can see that an addition was made to the longhouse and there was an additional one or two sweat lodges built. There's a hearth in the middle that has a kind of a strange shape there that's, that is pretty irregular and it's mostly just burnt charcoal that was found on the surface. But, you know, these sites, it's such a gift when one can find a late woodland site because you can actually see the remains, the, the outline of the houses themselves. And within the houses, you find pits and hearths and features that are loaded, loaded with artifacts. The other wonderful thing about late woodland archaeology is that there's a demonstrable cultural continuity between the late woodland peoples of Ontario and the First Nations who live here now. And that means that it gives us access to more information about the stories of these peoples and we can learn more about the things that we find on their archaeological sites through oral history and traditional knowledge. There are plenty of people, if you visit the Six Nations of the Grand, for instance, who still make a lot of their living from hunting and fishing. And some of the techniques aren't that different now from what they were then. Thirdly, and this is an interesting one, the late woodland archaeology of Ontario makes a really interesting contribution to our understanding of the cultural heritage landscape. Another stereotype that we routinely bump up against is the notion that the First Nations didn't really make productive use of their land, which is one of the justifications that the settler society used to explain away land seizures. One of my favorite quotes on the subject comes from one of my favorite, and I mean seriously one of my favorite actors, the great John Wayne who said, I, don't, I won't try and imitate him. I'm no good at that sort of thing. He said, I don't feel we did any wrong in, in taking this great country away from them. There were great numbers of people who needed new land, and the Indians were selfishly trying to keep it for themselves. And I, you know what? I love John Wayne. He was an interesting man, but I think this is an early, an exa an early example of what could alternatively, alternately be called Gwyneth Paltrow, Sean Penn, or Jenny McCarthy syndrome. And it's an illness that reminds us that the skill sets needed to pretend to be someone else, the skill sets needed to be an actor, don't make you an expert in healthcare or politics or social policy. A few years back in Kitchener, we found a late woodland village, that longhouse I showed you was from that village, that was once home to around 600 people. Now, assuming that the diet of those 600 people was about 50% maize, and this seems to be in the neighborhood of correct based on, uh, on studies we've done of bone isotopes, that would mean that the village needed about 219,000 pounds of maize per year to survive, which, if OMAFRA is correct in, in, in terms of corn yields, 
suggests that something between 51 and, and 270 acres of fields would have to have been under cultivation to produce that. And what's interesting about this is that we know from accounts of the early French explorers and missionaries that came through the area that the longhouse peoples they met liked to grow as much as three or four times what they needed to provide a buffer against crop losses and to give them some surpluses for trading with their neighbors, especially the Anishinaabeg. Now, if this is the case, that meant that the fields around our little villages, our little village, may have needed to produce as much as 876,000 pounds of maize per year on something between 200 and 1,080 acres of land, all of which would have to have been cleared by fire and stone axes and worked with nothing more complicated than digging sticks. Now it's been estimated that the Neutral and Wendat peoples of Southern Ontario had a population of around 70,000 people. Had they tried to grow enough maize for four years, that would have meant that they were aiming for an annual harvest of about 102,200,000 pounds of corn. And what that means is that much of Southern Ontario didn't look like this before contact, but like this. Which is to say, prior to contact, it seems clear that much of southern Ontario was a managed landscape with well-marked trails, a good deal of land under cultivation, and an almost park-like quality to it. And we see this in accounts of the earliest Dutch explorers that made their way from inland from, from New York State into the country of the Haudenosaunee, the Five Nations. And what that means is that our, not, our, our image of dark, foreboding woods with dark faces peeking out of them from the trees is almost certainly totally false. The question is, why does it still exist? And there'll be more on this later. So, contact. All of this changed after contact, but it's worth mentioning at this point that European contact took many forms and proceeded at differing paces in each. There were several types of frontiers. There was first off a disease frontier, which spread quite rapidly as soon as Europeans arrived and traveled across uh, traditional trade routes between First Nations. So for instance, there were, there were First Nations peoples who were dying of European diseases like influenza and tuberculosis years, years, sometimes decades before they saw any European. Secondly, there was a trade frontier in which European goods started appearing and impacting traditional value systems, uh, even of peoples who had not met a European yet, and that trade frontier spread quite quickly. We get Basque items from the, essentially from the latter part of the 15th century, showing up on archaeological sites north of Toronto, well, certainly by, by the 1500s. Third, there was the contact frontier as European traders and explorers and missionaries pushed further and further inland when they actually met one another face to face. And finally, there was a settlement frontier in which European settlers looked for land to make their home, almost always at the expense of indigenous land rights. Now Champlain arrived in what would become Ontario in 1615. And at roughly the same time, Europe developed a taste for beaver hats as a status symbol. You see a few examples of them here and, and a picture of Champlain and his wonderful mustache. Uh, soon after he arrived, the whole of eastern North America was engulfed in what we now call the Beaver Wars, which lasted roughly from 1628 to 1701. And as many of you probably know, this was a war over access to the hunting grounds and trade routes needed by fur traders to ensure a steady flow of beaver pelts into Europe. It was a terrible time in which thousands of indigenous people died for hats. On the other hand, the story from this period isn't entirely one about suffering and disaster and collapse. There are also narratives of strength, resistance and endurance in the face of overwhelming odds. On historic First Nation sites in the post-contact era between 1700 and 1850, we see plenty of evidence of cultural continuity, the survival of traditions, and a thoughtful and selective engagement with the settler society. This illustration, also by Emily, shows the Mohawk and Mississauga settlement at Davisville near Brantford in 1810. And in it, you can see that while European trade goods were in use, 
the lifestyle was still clearly a traditional one. You can see such traditions carrying on to this very day in values that emphasize harmony and sustainability, a distrust of materialism, continued hunting, fishing and gathering, traditional family structures, and the continued existence of clans, or in the case of the Anishinaabeg, dotums. You can substitute long houses for ranch houses and canoes for cars, but the underlying values endure. One of the things that I really find interesting about digging archaeological sites from this period is that one often finds money on Aboriginal sites, but the money has holes punched in it. And you say, why does it have a hole punched in it? Well, it has a hole punched in it because they didn't care about money, but they liked it as jewelry. So they punch holes in it and they would sew it onto their clothing. It's fabulous. By the way, two of the children illustrated in this, the one in the canoe and the one pushing the canoe, are two of my other daughters. Now, once we get into the historic or the documented era, there's many people who say, why do we need to do archaeology when we have written history? And the answer I give is always the same. History books rely on the written record for their facts, and sometimes that record is just plain wrong, willfully so even. In such cases, archaeologists are rather like forensic scientists, looking past what people said about themselves for facts about how they actually were. You know, it's an old joke in archaeology that people may stretch the truth, but their garbage speaks for itself. In a more unintentional sense, the historical record is often simply incomplete when it comes to the mundane details of how everyday people lived. Sometimes we find details about people with undocumented lives who might otherwise have slipped beneath the waves of history, never to be seen again. Often we find evidence of everyday activities and objects that were considered so simple, so basic, that nobody ever thought to take note of them. So without archaeology, they too would have been lost. Also, too often we have ignored important communities on the margins of the settler society, not just the First Nations, but black people, Irish Catholics, and others. In many cases, archaeology is the, almost the only way to contribute elements to the story of the past where history falls short, and it does so by, by providing tangible cultural materials, such as artifacts, that people can see and handle for themselves. So let's skip ahead to modern times. Not this one, but this one. Specifically, where we are right now in the relationship between Canada's First Peoples and the settler society. For centuries, and right to this day, we've operated within a colonialist framework, one in which the very institutions of our society seemed organized for the purposes of denigrating indigenous cultures, mistreating their persons, and erasing their languages, cultures, and histories. You know, we've taken Aboriginal cultures and we've, we've mocked them, we've made them ugly, and what we couldn't distort, we've taken. You know, there's a, there's a company out west that's gotten into trouble because they've, they've borrowed elements of indigenous fashion from, you know, the Cree and the Lakota. So, and frankly, historically, whenever that system's been threatened, we've turned to violence. And I'm referring here to places like Ipperwash and Oka. You know, Oka was a, you know, for those of you who, who remember it or, or who don't, um, Oka was a standoff in Oka, Quebec, where the community was trying to build a golf course on top of a Mohawk cemetery. And for whatever reason, everybody thought this was an okay idea. And if you see this picture, this poor soldier here facing off against a, a fellow with a, with a, uh, a mask over his face, you'll see it got pretty intense. And in fact, one gentleman uh, from the Sûreté de Québec ended up killed. But it's an ugly, ugly system. You know, I, if, if you look around at some of the illustrations here, you'll see that uh, just we haven't been kind. If you look at near the top, there, there's, there's an image of a very interesting looking Lakota man. His name was Titonke Yatonk. And he's known to history as Sitting Bull. Why do we call him Sitting Bull? It's an interesting thing. But with all the peoples in the world we encounter, those peoples are allowed to keep their names. But when it comes to indigenous peoples, we translate their names. Why do we do that? You know, when I, when I was in elementary school, my best friend was named Michael Armstrong. Now, Michael Armstrong, if you take the, if you, 
you know, if you take his two names, Michael, Michael is Hebrew, it means sword of God. Armstrong means he, come, he came from the part of Scotland that was settled by the Fortinbras family, uh, which was a French Norman family. And Fortinbras meant strong of arm. Now, nobody calls my friend Michael Armstrong sword of God strong of arm, but this fellow, Tatonka Yatonk, you know, this fellow who defeated General Custer in battle, despite having the might of the U.S. Army behind him, this fellow is called Sitting Bull. He's given a name that, you know, that remind, that sounds rather like the, like Ferdinand from the children's story. This textbook to the right of Tatonki Yatonk, Breastplate and Buckskin, that was my textbook when I went to, you know, when I went to elementary school and in grade six I learned about the First Nations. They weren't called the First Nations then, they were called Indians. And whenever a male was referred to in the book, he was called a brave. And whenever a female was referred to in the book, she was called a squaw. It's dreadful. Why do we use them as mascots on sports teams? Why do we mock them in, 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 in cartoons? It's an interesting, an interesting thing to contemplate. As we've treated the people, so we've treated their history. My friend Ron Williamson from Archaeological Services Inc. in Toronto has suggested that in Halton, Peel, York, and Durham regions alone, 8,000 archaeological sites were destroyed between 1951 in 1991. Imagine how many were lost in the rest of Ontario. There's an analogy I use when I'm, when I'm speaking to school kids about this, and frankly I spend more time speaking to school kids than I do grown-ups. But to explain to them just how precious an archaeological site is, I like, to, I like to get them to imagine that the archaeological record is kind of like this amazing zoo with thousands of rare and unique animals in it, but all of them female. When one of them dies, it's never going to be replaced ever. So why do we tolerate it? Now the insidious thing about colonialism is that it really doesn't need, as I said earlier, old school racism to survive. It doesn't need personalized forms of hostility or the ugly and overt state-sponsored racism of a, a Nazi Germany or an apartheid South Africa. It just needs a settler society to make some assumptions that go unquestioned and a relentless bureaucracy supported by the educational system churches and other institutions. If you accept these premises, the system has a terrible logic to it. If you accept that the First Peoples of Canada never made productive use of their land, then what's wrong with the fact that it was taken away from them? If you accept that the First Peoples of the Americas never made any significant sort of contribution to world history, art, or culture, then why bother celebrating it? If you accept that the cultures of the First Peoples were defined by violence and endemic warfare, what would be wrong with working to destroy those cultures and assimilate those peoples? And if you put together all these stereotypes, the image that emerges is of a people who can't be trusted to take care of themselves, have no moral claim to their lands, and are of a, temper a temperament that puts them on the wrong end of the moral spectrum. It's an interesting irony that we get upset about the Taliban destroying monuments in Afghanistan, but we're okay with hundreds of archaeological sites being destroyed every year here in Ontario. Or that we're horrified by images of African hunger and poverty, but we're comfortable with it on reserves here. Or that we complain about the environmental records of countries like China, but ignore the fact that we've polluted First Nations lands with mine tailings and mercury and waste products of tar sands extraction. You know, all of it. All of these images on this slide are, are images from news stories from the past week. You know, the top right, province ignores information about possible mercury dumping ground near Grassy Narrows. That was in the newspaper two days ago. Below that is an image of a Dene woman whose community was moved in the 1950s from the interior of Manitoba on a migration route of the Caribou to the barren shores of Hudson's Bay, where within 20 years, half of her community had died. The other image, of course, speaks for itself, on how it was more dangerous for a child to, to, to live in an Indian residential school than it was for a Canadian soldier to serve in World War II. Now things are starting to change, although in some ways we've been dragged kicking and screaming into this new relationship 
Specifically, since the 2000s, the Supreme Court has ruled repeatedly that developers, proponents, and the Crown have a duty to consult and accommodate with First Nations whose treaty rights may be impacted by projects. And with each new decision, these rights have been refined and expanded. We're on the verge of a sea change in the relationship between Canada and its First Peoples. As Martin Luther King said, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. We seem to be on the verge of recognizing the First Nations as one of the founding pillars of Canadian society, not just the two solitudes of French and English, but three. Now historically, we archaeologists have been a pretty quiet bunch. We work at a dusty offices and basements and universities, and frankly we tend to have personalities that make us more fit for dealing with the dead than the living. A lot of us just simply don't feel like we were born in the right time. All told, there's a certain sort of person who becomes an archaeologist, and that person is typically not socially that well adjusted. For years, too, I think we've suffered from the sort of spiritual malaise that you find when you feel like no one is interested in your vocation. We felt irrelevant and like nothing we did matters. But there's something we know, and it's something that we've always known, and it's something that suddenly matters. We archaeologists know how amazing the indigenous peoples of this place are. We know the incredible challenges they faced, the beauty and sustainability of their lifestyles, and the many fruits of their genius that we still benefit from to this day. Now suddenly we archaeologists, we dusty, socially inept archaeologists, are finding ourselves at the center of OMB hearings and land claims and high profile projects and on government agendas in ways that it would would have been considered unthinkable a few years ago. Now, if being part of this is something that interests you, I invite you to consider joining us at the OAS. Thank you. Paul, thank you so much. We're going to take You're questions welcome. now. Uh, one of our attendees says, thanks. How can we, uh, how certain can we be of archaeological resources in areas where there are known beaver dams. Mm, that's an interesting one, in northern Ontario especially. I assume my mic is still on. It is. Okay, good, good. I'm not talking to air. No, no, no. So I I'm, guarantee I'm, you there are plenty of folks listening to you. Okay, good, because I'm staring at a Gainsborough photo on the wall, and it's not <laughs> it's just not working in, in terms of, of personalizing our audience. So We're all with um, you. I'll look at Mr. Trudeau here hugging this wonderful First Nations woman. Um, yeah, it, it is tricky in the north, I'll grant you. We've had projects in the north where, you know, we, we came to look at the, at the land involved one year and, uh, you know, planned out how we were going to do our archaeological assessment. And the next year we arrived and found that beavers had dammed up a local creek and it was now essentially, uh, you know, submerged. So it certainly is tricky. That really, though, is the, I don't know, it's, it's, that's a natural process in the north. And typically, most of the archaeological sites we find tend to be on areas that are a little higher, a little, a little drier, and uh, less apt to be impacted. In the north especially, you, you, you do tend to find the sites along waterways, but it tends to be on navigable waterways. And those are simply too big to have been dammed up by beavers anyway. So the sites are typically on navigable waterways. They're often uh, where those waterways enter lakes, uh, particularly if there's a, a sandbar or something that can be camped on, or uh, alternative, alternatively, a, uh, a portage route. And we found wonderful sites going back 400 years and, and better on those. Paul, um, just to add to that, uh, the questioner says, the area I'm speaking of is actually in an area called Beaver Dams in the Niagara region. It was a ah, community Beaver settled yeah, at the intersection of two important <laughs> trails north of the Beaver Dams Creek that led to Deco Falls. I'm pronouncing that wrong. But yeah, Beaver Dams? Yes, Beaver Dams the place, not Beaver Dams the thing. Oh, man. Can you edit this out so I appear less dumb? <laughs> it's all fine. No, there, there, there's an for all of southern Ontario, there's an archaeological assessment process 
that is in place um, at the provincial level that's supported by the provincial policy statement of 2014, which is excellent at locating sites. Uh, where it falls apart is that the requirement for it under the Planning Act isn't always well implemented by the municipalities and unfortunately also um, there are the archaeological industry is rather poorly regulated so there are certain firms who sadly and I mean sadly in a in a colonial sense who sadly feel that they have a right to to I'm mincing words here. I shouldn't be, but essentially, they feel that it's it's completely reasonable for their them to take money to look the other way uh, and not find archaeological sites. Thank you. I'll put the questioner in touch with you afterwards. I think perhaps there's a little further discussion that might be had. Um, sure. We have another great question. Do you have? favorite or suggested places in Ontario, sites that we can visit to see woodland sites or archaeological artifacts? Where where can we go in a tourism kind of way to see these things? Well, in a tourism kind of way, uh, the places that I like to take my kids are places like there's there's a there's a reconstructed village called Scanadot near London, um, just the other side of London. Um, there is uh, the Crawford at Crawford Lake, which is just off of Guelph Line, um, just uh, a little bit west of Milton. They have a partially reconstructed village there. That's pretty good. If you go into Kitchener, there's been some interpretive signage and trails put up around the archaeological site that I, you know, the one that I showed uh, you people the um, the sketch of the longhouse from. So that one is certainly accessible. And there is the Lawson site, which is at the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, which you can visit in London, uh, where there is a partially reconstructed site there. Um, the last one I can think of is um, there is both an, an Aboriginal section that's been set aside at St. Marie Among the Hurons in Midland. And then there is the Huronia Museum in Midland. And both of those have reconstructed longhouses and interpreters who work out of those longhouses to explain the, uh, uh, their archaeology. Thank you. I think St. Marie Among the Hurons is, a, is an excellent idea. Um, my family enjoyed it ever so much. Um, I think if there are no other questions pending, um, do you want to give a last word or two or um, at all, Paul? Uh, well, you know, I just I, I think I'd just like to reiterate that that there's something big going on right now, and I don't know. I, I I'll make it personal. I, that, that's probably the easiest way to put it. You know, we're there's a. I was listening the other day to a to a philosopher and he was chatting actually about LGBTQ rights and he was talking about the, the point he made was that when you're in a group that benefits from the status quo it's very hard for you to see the problems of people who are outside that group and I was listening to him talk about this and it hit me like a brick because when I was when I was a little fellow for whatever reason my dad decided uh, and this was in the later part of the 1970s, that we should move to Alberta. So we moved to northern Alberta, and he worked in the in what a, at the time were called the tar sands. And uh, we lived in Athabasca, and just outside of town, there was a little First Nations community there with houses that would have been an embarrassment in the third world. Hmm. And I went to school with kids who who didn't have lunches to bring and wore threadbare clothes. And for whatever reason, I just didn't see it and I look back on that now and I think how could I not have seen that it was right there it was up in my face and you know that's the that's the way in which colonialism is insidious you know we we've done such a great job over 350 years of telling ourselves that indigenous cultures were worthless that you know we've we've internalized it we've internalized it so well
that were willing to put up with things happening to, happening to indigenous peoples that we would never tolerate, certainly for ourselves, but really almost anywhere else in the world. And yet, if if you if you if people talk about it, and if if there's not a mic or somebody recording it on their phone cam, you always hear the same thing, and that is somehow that they deserved it, or what are they complaining about? They they don't have to pay taxes, or there, there's all of these things that are ridiculous and and largely untrue that you hear that are somehow held up as justification for for why that you know they should be forced to lead miserable lives, and one of the things that I found so exciting lately is that, you know, it's it's like I said at the end of the talk, you know, we archaeologists, we're there's there's a good many of us, and I, this is not a joke, but there's a good many of us who are on really on the autism spectrum, and it, and 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 I say that with a straight face, like it's just not that uncommon to find people who had what they used to call Aspergers, and and which is now just called you know, autism spectrum. Um, there are a lot of us in archaeology because we like, it, you know, we like to be in a basement. We like to be with things that are dead rather than alive. We like quiet. We like, you know, fiddly details and research and looking through microscopes and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, we've been kind of a dusty profession and <sighs> Suddenly now we're 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 finding ourselves in this position where we can actually we can actually make a contribution, and I, I'm I'm sort of I'm I'm starting to imagine the OAS as being almost a you know a, a group of apostles you know people who understand the archaeological record and who who appreciate just how wonderful these indigenous societies and peoples were, and who take that to the world, who spread that gospel to the world. And we're, we're really pushing hard on, on social media and on our website and we're, we're, you know, we're essentially lobbying to, you know, to get this message out there. Because I think we're, we're particularly well positioned to attack those stereotypes with facts. And it's facts that nobody's come and asked us before and we've done a terrible job at, you know, of, of propagating, but uh, something's going on. There's there's something in the air, and I'm I'm really hopeful that, uh, you know, we're going to see something good come out of this. Well, your talk today certainly made a contribution towards our increasing understanding of past and current uh, realities. So thank you for bringing Ontario history to life for us today, Paul. You're very welcome. So, um, everybody, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. The next in our series will be in September on information technology for heritage organizations based on the experience of us, of our OHS um, experience planning for our IT infrastructure upgrades. And I hope you can join us. Please visit our website in September. A little bit about membership. We encourage you to become a member of the OHS if you're not already. The Society's programs and services offer great support and resources for historical groups and institutions, historians, students, educators, and your support will help continue to promote the importance of history education in Ontario's classrooms, museums, and heritage spaces. Please visit the OHS website for more information on becoming a member or contact our membership coordinator. Thank you again very much to our speaker, Paul Racher, President of the Ontario, the Ontario Archaeological Society. And thanks to everyone for attending today's session. Uh, I've enjoyed it very much and I hope you have too. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.